Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for making it to the stream. Um, and thank you, Noah. I just caught the, the end of, of the last thing. And actually, lots of what I'm talking about follows on from a lot of um, what he's saying too. So um, I'm much more used to presenting to a live audience where I can see all of your gorgeous faces and somehow this is more terrifying. Who knew? All right, it's good. Uh, so I'm Meg Giant and I'm a writer, a narrative designer, a speaker and a consultant. I was lead writer on Inkle Studios' anti-colonial steampunk retelling of Jules Verne's classic novel, 80 Days. And I'm currently the lead writer on Sable um, with the incredibly talented team at Shedworks. Um, and in between, I've worked on indie titles like Falcon Age and Boyfriend Dungeon, um, as well as the lush narratives of Sunless Sea and Summer Skies. I also recently did the story for This War of Mines, uh, latest DLC, and I've got a ro mobile interactive romance based on the world of Titanic in soft launch for 21st Century Fox's Storyscapes. So as you can see, I mostly work in the indie space uh, with smaller teams, but I have dipped my toes into AAA as part of the writing team on Horizon Zero Dawn. I wrote a lot of Aloy's box, so if you enjoyed her annoyance when she fell into ponds or ran low on arrows, you know who to blame. <laughs> and recently, I also hosted the IGF Awards at GDC 2019. I was the first woman of color to host the awards, and I called for unionization and fairer treatment for workers in this industry, as well as calling out deep-rooted issues of Islamophobia, sexism, racism, and other bigotries. But I think more importantly, I asked the question, what can we do to make people feel welcome? How do we ensure that people from all backgrounds and perspectives can live and work and create sustainably in our field? I think that, more than anything, is the question that we all need to answer. And in some ways, this talk is the mirrored image of that one. Uh, that talk was addressing the industry more broadly, and here, this is more personal. Um, it should hopefully give you some answers to an equally relevant question, one that needs to be answered while we do the structural work and long-term work of changing the industry for the better, and that is, how do we survive now? So I nearly titled this talk Survival Tips for the Other, but I think it makes sense to call it Working in the Margins because I'm going to be talking about a variety of margins and marginalizations here. Um, personally, I'm a visible brown woman in the industry, though I currently live and work in the UK. I'm Indian, not British Indian, as people assume, entirely Indian. and um, I'm also committed to a global view of the games industry, um, both in terms of ideas and practice from outside of the West. I'm also a freelancer, and I have never been in-house at any point in my career. Uh, and I think that's something that's becoming much more normal and, and, and usual in the industry, which is really what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about this in, in a talk about marginalization a little bit, because being freelance allowed me to have a career um, while dealing with a chronic illness and being freelance and working remotely and or really um, are non-traditional models and structures of work which can particularly benefit people who are dealing with you know health issues mental or physical disability childcare, or just care more generally and allow people to sustain careers which can adapt around their lives and that is hugely, hugely important for us as workers, particularly in the games industry, which is, let's be honest, not really known for its, um, you know, work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, our careers also need to be resilient enough to weather a chronic illness, an ill relative, a child, or outside commitment of any kind. They need to be resilient enough to survive the realities of life. They can't only be possible if we achieve and maintain perfection because that's an impossible demand. So there were no maps for me, uh, no well-traveled paths that I could follow. And in many ways, I had to become a cartographer. Many of us working in the margins do, I think. And that is an additional burden placed on us. There are fewer or sometimes no, mod no other models to base our expectations on. There aren't that many people who uh, out there who can speak to what we're experiencing. 
Um, but I still remain immensely grateful for the kindness and generosity and openness of the indie dev community. And I wouldn't be where I am without that help and advice. And I think it's, it's important, particularly for those of us who have been marginalized, to reach out and help our friends. Um, and our colleagues and our allies, which goes back to what Noah was talking about in the in the previous stream as well, um, and what Brandon and Larry have been talking about with with this this entire conference. Um, and I still feel at times like I'm inventing my own job, my own career path, my own set of best practices, and hints and lists of mistakes never to make again. And I'm sharing some of my mistakes with you all in the hopes that you will be able to learn from them and make your own mistakes so that I can then learn from them in turn. <laughs> okay, so to ease us into the snares and pitfalls of this discussion, um, I thought I'd start us off with something easy, the issue of money. So <laughs> now I need to carry out this next bit uh, because wanting to make games and wanting to make money from making games are really two separate matters. And the nature of capitalism is that it reduces the value of creation and, and endeavors to their profitability and their commercial viability. And you know that's not the entirety of, of meaning in the world. We need a thriving, vibrant art game scene and that's valuable just on its own terms. So really being in the margins can be good. And there are many people living and working here in a variety of ways. But today I'll be focusing more on speaking to people who want to live and work sustainably in the margins outside of the AAA space, but also those who perhaps want to enter those spaces and learn how to navigate them. Um, but back to money. <laughs> the biggest advice I have for devs working in the indie space is to think about royalties, profit sharing, so I was extremely lucky that Inkle Studios, um, who were the studio that made 80 Days that I worked on uh, as a contractor, suggested to me that I get a smaller upfront fee and then royalties on the back end when I was discussing working with them on 80 Days. Uh, I should also say here that 80 Days was my first professional job. Uh, in the games industry. And at the time, I really had no idea that this wasn't a more us uh, usual payment structure for a contractor in a game. And uh, the more I've been in the industry, the more I genuinely believe that uh, this is the kind of way forward. Um, it's still really unusual. And that's why I really wanted to talk about it more, um, particularly in this venue, uh, because royalties from 80 Days have been a huge part of me being able to find a satisfying and sustainable career. And the long tail on some indie games is most certainly real. Having money come in every month after the launch of the game allowed me to plan a little bit more, to have a sense of stability, which is hugely important in a freelance lifestyle, and also to be able to be a bit more thoughtful about the next jobs that I took on. I also am um, profit sharing, or I have royalties on my upcoming game with Shedworks Sable. And um, this is not, and I think also it's important to note that this isn't just on a financial benefit. Profit sharing also means that you are sharing risk. So it really does come down to a judgment call, whether you think you'll be adequately compensated for your time um, and the kind of team you're working with. But on the positive side, that responsibility and that risk also comes with much greater creative control and a real sense of ownership, which I think can sometimes be missing in contract work. And I do think that, that I've managed to sort of carve out a, a middle pass between completely work for hire and being in-house at a studio. And, and, and I think that's only gonna become more plausible um, as time goes on in the industry. So I actually think that this profit sharing model can be really great for studios as well as individual devs because it encourages everyone on the team to feel like they have a stake in the creative process and the product as well as the rewards. It's also something that in my experience, indies are much more open to, particularly if they're squeezed for capital during dev, but anticipate post-launch profits. Um, but it's also something that I've seen, you know, other uh, kind of ascended indies or, or, or bigger folks do. And so with 80 Days, in terms of deciding whether this is a good option for you or not, um, with 80 Days, Inkle were able to show me projections of profits from their previous games, which were relatively similar in, in kind of tone and approach. And that could give me an indicator of how much compensation I might potentially receive, which also allowed me to, to kind of make a cal 
make a calculated risk, I suppose, about how much time I was going to put in, you know, and, and, and what else I was going to turn down in order to do it. But uh, many indies, I think, might not have those projections or their new game might be so radically different as to make those projections largely obsolete because the games industry is many and varied. Uh, but in which case, my advice would be to um, do your due diligence, ask around about people's reputation, get references from devs who have worked there, particularly devs who no longer work there anymore, um, but also be realistic and trust your own judgment as you determine how much work is worth the risk. There really aren't any formulas here, uh, but at a base level, you know, do you think that they respect you, your work and your time? If the answer is no, then I would really suggest being extremely careful about entering this kind of business relationship with people. There are downsides to being an outside contractor without a stake, but the real advantage of that position is that if a business relationship doesn't work out, you can kind of cut ties easily and move on. But if you take on royalties and by extension, greater ownership, it's a much more serious and long-term commitment. And if you don't have basic confidence in the goodwill and good faith of those you're contracting with, then I think that's a big red flag. So I'm talking about this particularly from a writer's perspective. And to an extent, there is also a little bit of a form, I suppose, um, precedence for writers, you know, taking a percentage, like in the literary world, it's sort of 10% is, is very normal. But but I do think that profit sharing more generally for devs is, is really the future. And if this is the kind of thing that interests you, uh, Scott Benson and Bethany Hockenberry of Night in the Woods, of the Night in the Woods team have recently been talking pu both publicly and eloquently about creating workers co-ops. And I know that the Game Workers Union who are you know, part of GDUX in this conference, they're also a really great resource for thinking about ways in which you know, we can be more equitable and fair, particularly if you're thinking about starting a studio with a colleague, something that I'm gonna be doing with my colleague Lee Alexander later this year, or, or if more generally, if you want to know your rights. And this kind of brings me to a broader point, which is talk to people about money uh, and I know this is hard, particularly if you're British uh, or, you know, if you're shy or reticent in any way, but especially if you're a freelancer, this is, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's a muscle that you need to learn how to flex. It's, it's just a skill that you need to learn how to develop, really. Um, tell your peers your day rate and ask them what theirs are. Uh, there were a few people early on in my career who uh, were really open about this and told me in no uncertain terms to double what I was asking for. And uh, I'm really thankful for that intervention and that openness on their part. So if you can be that for somebody else, or if there's someone that you look up to in your field or is part of a social or professional circle, you know, try asking, you know, it never hurts to ask. Um, and if and when you become established, uh, remember that the way people treat you trickles down. So, you know, I mean, this this is true in the broader sense, but, but I mean, also, um, you know, if you demand respect and a decent rate as someone with a reputation, that raises the bar for those who are up and coming. And it just generally raises the standard of working conditions and compensations for the entire industry. And and I think if if we are lucky enough and privileged enough and to be in a position where, you know, we have that kind of power or, or that kind of place, then then it's really important to make sure that we're thinking about those who are coming up and really not pulling the ladder up after ourselves. And so if there's really one piece of advice that you remember from my talk and you forget everything else, it really should be this, do not undercut or undermine your colleagues. Instead, find ways to recommend or reward and uplift them. The industry is big, but your peer group really isn't. Uh, and I have I have received more work and more recommendation from, I've received more work through the recommendations of colleagues than I have through my own reputation and talks or, or even my awards. And I suspect over the course of a career, uh, that will be true of most people. <laughs> so always have other people to recommend. Um, and, and this is something, you know, it's worth working on and worth making an effort to build up a, a little 
I was going to say Rolodex, but that's going to date me. Uh, just a, a contact sheet of people to talk about, uh, and particularly people from different backgrounds and perspectives to your own, as well as those, as those who are similar to you, you know, because that will help you hand off work that people are coming to you specifically for. Seek out those people and be generous to people who are coming up or less established. This has never, ever backfired on me and has in truth meant that I have a group of people to share concerns and worries with, not to mention the sheer pleasure of watching talented and kind human beings excel and find their place and really add their much needed voices to the games industry. So uh, tokenization, this is another really big issue that I wanna talk about and particularly affects women and marginalized folks. So. Uh, I've certainly found myself invited to talks and panels, becoming prominent and becoming prominent um, because of my work, but also in part because I'm a brown woman, in quotations. Uh, and it's been really important for me to find a way to maintain my own sense of integrity and purpose in that process. So for me, it was a realization that if I was given a platform, it mattered less why I was being given being given that platform than what I was planning to do with it. If what I was gaining from a particular invitation outweighed the tokenization, and particularly if what I was going to be able to communicate using that platform outweighed the tokenization, uh, then go right ahead. But but that's kind of a balance that you need to, to really find. So I found myself inundated with requests to speak. Uh, you know, partly because people respect my craft, but also because I tick more than one box being a brown woman. And while initially, you know, I thought this is really useful and worthwhile work to be diversifying di diversifying panels and speaker lists, there was really no one to tell me that this kind of prominence is also labor and it has a cost. It takes up an enormous amount of time to prepare and give these kinds of talks or panels, not to mention the travel and the social costs, costs and, the and the exhaustion. And that represents in a very real way, time away from your own work and development. And I had to find my own balance here. And I think we all kind of do to a greater or lesser degree, but the industry does have a way of insidiously and, and actually largely unintentionally, though it doesn't make it any less insidious, trying to funnel marginalized people into the path of becoming a talking head rather than a dev. And that is absolutely fine if that is your goal and, and that's what you've come to the industry to do. But for me, it was a kind of thunderstrike realization that this time away, presenting, speaking, sharing ideas had value for me in terms of building a reputation and sharing knowledge, but could also inhibit the real work that I had come to the industry to do. And actually, there did, did come a point in my career where I realized that you know, the people inviting me were getting more out of my presence than I was. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not flattering to be invited. And, and so kind of learning how to say no in a judicious way and, and being really strategic about my own career, you know, it, it's hard. I'm not a biz dev person and, and that's not my instinct and my nature. I'm, I'm a really, I'm a woo woo artist about it, but, um, you know, it, uh, I think it, it was just, it's, it's hugely important to recognize your own value because um, there are many instances in where, where the industry intentionally or otherwise attempts to devalue you. Which actually brings me perfectly to my next point, which is about um, imposter syndrome, which is something that disproportionately affects women and marginalized folks and people of color, but also, you know, just people in general. Uh, and if you're marginalized in any way, it can be hard to hold on to the idea that imposter syndrome is utterly ridiculous and, and is actually false, even though it is. Uh, I still struggle with it. I know a lot of my friends and my colleagues do. It's hugely important, I think, for all of us and particularly anyone who is remotely other to balance an openness to criticism with a reckon with a recognition of our own value. And I say this because there will be many people out there all too willing to ascribe your achievements to your background or your identity and, and why it's really important to develop that robust sense of self that I was talking about earlier and to deny the worst and most continual voices in your own head that tell you that you don't have a place here because you do. And, and really the truth of it, I think, is that the industry needs people like us even more than we need the industry.
kind of, so to kind of illustrate that point, I guess so. I, I have a colleague who is like an older white man, um, and he released a narrative game around the same time that I released 80 Days. And he once told me casually that the reason that I was getting more press than he was um, was because you're a brown woman. Um, and even though it was ridiculous, uh, it kind of it stuck with me. Um, and I had to do a lot of work to unpack that uh, and to, to kind of find my way into recognizing whether that was a legitimate criticism or not. And so I've done that work so that you don't have to. When someone says this to you, uh, seriously, just ignore the shit out of them. Um, so, because the truth is, the advantages of being marginalized in the games industry are far, far outweighed by the disadvantages. If I'm one of the few brown women who are prominent, that's because brown women are disadvantaged. And a few extra interviews in the gaming press does very little to redress that balance. Um, so it's also important <laughs> in a kind of separate way, and this is almost on the other side of the matter, to talk about how women and minorities are reduced to talking about their work as though it only encompasses initiatives towards diversity and inclusion rather than any other work they may be doing. Uh, giving the diversity talk is a rite of passage for many of us. I did mine at GDC and I think it was in 2016. You can watch it on YouTube. It's called 10 Ways to Make Your Game More Diverse. I'm really proud of it. I think it was extremely valuable and useful. Um, but at the moment, um, I feel I feel very done. I feel very done. I feel like I've put in my time. I'm done with addressing the majority. And I'm really much more interested in talking about how we can get more diverse voices and perspectives around the table um, and in key roles and with authority. So. A big part of what I do is also consulting. Uh, I recently consulted with Fail Better about colonialism and its impacts um, on the latest game, uh, on their latest game, Summer Skies. This was incredibly fruitful and rewarding because Fail Better were really open, welcoming, and engaged in the entire process. And they were committed to dealing with these issues in an active and uh, thoughtful fashion. Um, but I entirely sympathize with friends and colleagues who are um, really tired of coming in to consult or being asked to, to put this in the crudest way possible, I guess, come in to polish a turd. And many of the jobs I'm offered often involve coming in as an afterthought. And I think this is a, a really common experience amongst people who are in, in any way others or diverse in the industry, you know, um, that you're really brought in as an afterthought to make something terrible a little bit less terrible. And, and that's useful and good work. But I also think it is time that we were offered seats at the table rather than scraps. And also at times, you know, in the industry, your marginalization can be a lever. And by which I don't mean play the race card, not that there even is one, but um, what I mean here is that if you are a marginalized person or if you're in any way other, um, your our very presence can allow for the broaching of particularly difficult subjects. And it's a really good reminder to other people in the room that the audience is not entirely cis, white, male, middle class, Western, abled, and straight. And if people are operating in good faith, that can be all the opening you need to have a genuine and broad ranging conversation that, that uh, really challenges the status quo. Good faith is really enormously important. And it leads me into my next point, which is finding the right collaborators. Personally, um, I've always been incredibly clear about my values and interests and in the type of work that I find meaningful. And I've been public about that. Um, and that, that's been a useful screening measure for me. These days, if someone approaches me, it's usually because they're familiar with my work or my public presence, or if they aren't, my Twitter is public and it's pretty vocal. Um, I found this to be an advantage. There are probably people who don't approach me based on my public presence. And that's to the good in my opinion, because it would be unlikely that we would make good collaborators or that I would, I would have a fruitful or sustaining time collaborating with them. Uh, 
I know that the people who do approach me are serious and share at least some of my interests and concerns. And at the very least, I'm more, I'm more likely to end up working with people who are open-minded and willing to listen and respectful of my expertise. Um, you know, and I think we've all been in that situation where we're like the only voice in the room uh, and, it, and it can be incredibly draining, I think, and frustrating and damaging to you to, to, to kind of have to have to be doing that work day in and day out, especially if that's additional work that you're doing alongside your actual job. So not everyone will want what you're saying, uh, but that's that's OK, particularly if one of the things that you want from your career is to be able to do meaningful work in a healthy and respectful and encouraging environment. So I'm really deeply aware that not everyone can be picky about their work, but I personally have always found that the things that make me different and the perspectives that, that I have that are outside of the norm are really what bring value and insight to the teams that I work in and on everything from content to design to accessibility and implementation. And also, you know, I know myself and I do much better work when I'm in a nurturing environment and you know, I, I, and I think that's okay. I think that's one of those things that's difficult to talk about, you know, particularly if you're a woman, you know, you're, you're meant to be really tough and, and kind of, you know, not ask for accommodation. But, but honestly, I've mostly found, particularly in the indie game sphere, that, that people really want to enable you to do your best work. And, and if you know going into a collaboration, you know, a few structures or a few ways of interacting and communication and being, and if those things will enable you to do much better work, you know, I, I think it's almost your professional responsibility to talk about them rather than being, you know, selfish or, or self-involved. And, and I think it, it's a really worthwhile thing to do. And it can also be really useful at, at that stage, you know, in the interview stage, if you bring up these concerns and the team that you're about to work with is extremely dismissive of that, that's a really huge red flag as well. So last year, um, and I talked about this a little bit at my my IGF speech. Um, I became I became so chronically ill that I was unable to work. So I have endometriosis, uh, which if you don't know what that is, Google it. Uh, but which, when it's unmanaged, it causes me. It, it used to cause me enormous pain nearly daily, and uh, I did something extremely stupid that I really don't recommend, which is putting off medical treatment because I had a deadline to meet and I had, you know, a series of deadlines to meet and I, and I prioritized those short term deadlines over my long term health and my prospects. And it was a really, really terrible idea. Uh, don't do this. I burned myself out uh, to the point that I, I lost the joy that made my work meaningful and, and, and that made my work worth doing. And it really took that crisis for me to reevaluate my relationship to work and stress and, and self-care or, or self-management. Um, and this is particularly relevant if you're a freelancer. There's no one else to, there's no one around to notice if you work around certain issues, sure, but there's also no one to notice if you're struggling and there's nobody to tell you to go home <laughs> or take a few days off. So during my IGF speech, I said, um, it is time that we as an industry left behind the idea that our work is made better by our pain and that the price of passion is exploitation. And that is something that I, I, I really believe. We need to be kind to ourselves, but more importantly than that, more importantly, we need to know ourselves. This is what will enable us to ask for accommodations for our mental and physical health, for the realities of our lives to learn to commit ourselves wholeheartedly, but still pragmatically, to drown out the negative voices in our own heads with positive ones, and to actively carve out sustainable spaces for ourselves. And particularly in Indie Dev, I, I found there to be room for negotiation, room for accommodation, room for us to be human beings with interests and cares outside of video games and that in no way compromises our passion and our drive and honestly i think it's much better to ask and be refused than to not ask at all and the very fact that you're answering asking the question normalizes the fact that this is something that can be talked about at work and, and i think it's hugely important so uh i hope that my talk makes it feel more possible to survive and thrive here in the margins of 
our wonderful and terrible industry. Uh, I certainly believe it is if we lift ourselves and, and each other's up. So uh, that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you all so much for listening. And before you get out of here, though, we do have questions yeah. from the Twitch audience. But first, thank you so much thank for your presentation. You. Can you hear us? My pleasure. Oh, OK, cool. Yes, I can. All right. Okay. Sorry about the interruption. We were like, hey, hold on. We, we <laughs> no, might no, 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 don't worry about it. <laughs> OK, cool. All right. We had enough scares today. We don't want another one. Uh, so this question um, is from our, our audience, obviously. Uh, this is Hoxie 3D. Hey. Uh, the <laughs> question. The question is, I'm looking at camera, Larry kind of switched the camera on me. Yeah. Uh, as a white male, are there any tips you would have for me to help others become more comfortable in the workplace? Also, if I was writing a story, whether it be in games or otherwise, how could I avoid tokenism? And by others, being those of different creeds, races, or gender? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think that's a really great question. There's a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of talks out there. If, if you have access to the GDC vault um, and just sort of type in diversity or inclusion, you know, my talk, which is 10 ways to make your game more diverse, it's available on um, YouTube. And, and it really is kind of a primer on this, um, which I think is really useful. And, and, and really, it's, it's, I particularly wrote it and talked about it in, a, in kind of friendly, accessible language, not really using like buzzwords and all of that stuff. You know, so, so I think there's loads of resources out there. But generally, I think, you know, it's good to be asking that question. And I think, you know, above and beyond what you can do, I think facilitating other people, you know, if there's somebody in a meeting who is marginalized in some way and you think they had a really good idea that the team didn't quite listen to, just, just you know, pause the meeting and just go, hey, actually, I, I saw that this person had something to say. Would you like to say that again? You know, give them the opportunity to, like, raise up their voices. Um, you know, and... and, and Fundamentally, I think, you know, there's nothing that's that's really off limits for anyone to talk about. Um, but I think there's there's a lot out there that allows, you know, people from outside, particularly white folks from outside um, other experiences of marginalization to talk about the other. But, you know, I think as worthwhile as that is also, uh, you know, kind of talking about these issues at work, um, you know, go and, and kind of actually um, facilitate other people. Um, I, you know, so recently I was I was at a games company where I was the only first of all the only woman and of course the only brown person um, in in the room, and it, it, I really appreciated it that that sort of many people individually just came up to me and said, "Hey, we really like your work. We really value your perspective, and we're really open. We really want to hear what you have to say." And particularly if you're coming in as a contractor, if you're a new hire, that's those are such valuable words to hear. Like, "Hey, we know who you are. We value you." and we are open to hearing what you have to say and please feel free to call us out as well those are great words to hear too you know it just shows a kind of willingness i think so i've got a, a question and this is kind of personal i i would say we might have fought yeah. we've probably fought some similar fights in our careers and I one of the issues uh <laughs> see it didn't even have to say much more than that but one of the issues i think about is just like in my personal stance on tokenization and yours as well, uh, how do you feel about like the beneficial side that there is potentially more people of color, especially being you know brown female or African American, anything male or female for me? Yeah. I would say like so. Let's just say folks like us, regardless of we know that this platform is trying to leverage that and bring that community in. Yeah. Is there value that you take out of it to say? But you know what? If like. 10 people see me there and then get inspired yeah. to do this, like that door opens more or less. So I guess what's your personal stance on like at least bringing that kind of thought into your decision making when saying yay or nay to uh, a tokenized situation? I mean, you know, I think, I think, I, I, yeah, I, I think I'm, I think we're on the same page on this one because to me it's always, it's, it is worth it. It's certainly worth it if it's even going to move the dial forward a little bit, but but I think for me, it was it was it's the moment at which, you know, uh, what I found is okay, right? We want you to come here and you talk about these issues of diversity, and and you know, we want to be really inclusive. But then I show up on the day, and you know, the diversity means me, and and really, <laughs> I'm not the link. <laughs> the old bait switch. You know what I mean? So so it's it's I guess when I come back year on year to certain conferences or spaces, and I see that they're 
you know, the, the change isn't really happening, that really what's happening is that these people are just patting themselves on the back and saying, oh, we did diversity, we got Meg to talk. And it's, you know, they're not going out and finding more people or or attempting to address that on a more structural yeah. level. And, and I think at that point that gets frustrating. Um, and, you know, but I think it, it's, it's so personal. Like at what point does it become, you know, less worthwhile? I think, you know, you have to be mindful of your own time and value it. Uh, because really no one else will. Um, you know, I, I guess for me as well, like even, you know, hosting the IGF Awards, there was a, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say it, it was tokenization, but but there's an extent to which also I knew that I was going to come into a lot more hate, just sheerly being a brown woman presenting. So it wasn't as easy for me to just say yes even though this is something that is great for anybody's career, right? I mean, why would anyone think twice about saying yes to hosting the IGF Awards? But there was a greater cost that I was going to pay. Um, you know, I had to lock down my Twitter and Nazis found me for about two weeks. Um, you know, but at the same time, I really thought that what I was going to say there was was important enough uh, to, to kind of counteract the price that I was going to pay. Just my sheer presence was valuable. Um, you know, and, and I heard from loads of like, you know, queer folks and people of color and marginalized folks who were like, it was so great to see a woman of color on the stage. And, you know, if I've got to take two weeks of Nazis for that, I'm in a privileged enough position that that rolls rolls off my back, you know. Um, and if I can get that hate so that somebody else feels like they have a face here, then bring it on. Man, that's that's heartbreaking though because you're someone of value you're someone of worth who adds to the production regardless of a demographic that you come from you know what i mean yeah. and that alone like is like a benefit to you being there let alone like oh you're also representing communities that don't get representation so you have a whole load of folks who are cheering for you in that present moment to know that like people who don't have to deal with or come through or break through any of those same barriers are gonna look at you and say, oh, IGF, this and that, let me go hound her Twitter for two weeks mm -hmm. because I don't wanna spend two minutes turning the channel because I can't stay and watch it. Like I have right. a personal issue, so I need to make a big thing about it and right. hurt this person or bring this person down mm -hmm. because I have an issue, right? Mm -hmm. Like this person is doing great things for people don't even care that I hate them right now because she's shining on that stage mm -hmm. and she's helping present and she's hosting a damn award show. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'm bigger than this, mm -hmm. right? Like my, I'm more important than this. My hate is more important than this. So I need to go be an ass, mm -hmm. excuse my language sponsors. And then like, just go yeah. flood all her personal accounts and do whatever yeah. I can to bring her down. So she never thinks about doing this again because yeah. that's what the world needs. Right, right, right. It's a, it's a, it's a dangerous world. Obviously uh, we're streaming this on, everything's becoming more and more online and you're opening it up to, to the rest of the world for, for every type of criticism. That's I worked terrible. with Larry personally a few times, right? Uh, I like to say that I fit within this market, but not really. There's a lot of Asians in the game industry. So I'm actually outside the bubble, I think. But I do react. Yeah. No, Go I'm going to stop you there, Brian. I don't think that that's right because I, I think, I think that there's still like you know, certainly in the technical fields, there's lots of Asians of my of like South Asians, East Asians, but still like across the industry in positions of power, certainly not. I agree. I haven't been in a position of power yet, so I, I haven't been able to see it from that top. But I do see, and this is probably a question to, to you, Meg, and, and to Larry. I've asked him many times. Like, to, to get through the issues, obviously, going to a workplace and talking to your colleagues, right? You definitely feel uh, the atmosphere of uh, change as soon as you walk in the room. Like, how do you get through that? Do you just focus on the the, the tasks on hand and and just kind of truck through or do you should should you kind of acknowledge it and try to get through it i mean what what would be your suggestion to kind of clear the air and just move on to working <laughs> sure so i guess so i'll say this uh i went in as a designer in the game industry and while I was professionally a designer, I've never had another African-American designer be on the team with me mm -hmm. that I can recall. And I'm thinking hard on this, but I think it was like me yeah. and a lot of white people on the design <laughs> team. Yeah. Uh, Sam Way was on the design team while we were at Spark, so he was an Asian designer there. Yeah. But for the most part, like I'm representing, you yeah, know what I mean? And so I guess what I noticed was, I would say at first, regardless of them being very welcoming, like, hey, Larry, yes. we value you, we this, we that, we this, we that, you know, we're here to support you. And like that opening, I still felt like there was like a period of like, 
maybe re I'll call it reverse imposter syndrome where we're like, yeah, we like him. He speaks well. He did good work. He did the interviews well. But does he fit with us? Yeah. He, that, that underlying. Yeah. And it, it, there feels like, like a week or two or a month of like kind of like just getting used to little things. little like, hey, is he comfortable enough for me to talk about this with him? Or yeah, is he comfortable? Like non-job related, yeah, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I found myself having to represent the African-American <laughs> community many times in discussion yeah. when something happened that other people didn't understand yeah. or wanted my perspective on. Mm. And I like, I would have to take these things on and like, okay, let me put, take off my Larry <laughs> hat, put on my NAACP <laughs> hat. talk for my people. So the black people feel like, like yeah. I've had that conversation many times. But then I, I would say like after a while, yeah. It, it started to disappear and all the companies that I've worked with I've never had like a from the from my peers I've never had like a blatant like oh my god I'm about to quit over this shit oh, I'm yeah, about yeah, to fight yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean I haven't had that mm -hmm. but I have had like little subtle like we don't know we don't we don't and What's then after a while like oh no yeah. it's Larry like yeah, yeah. I became Larry but I felt like I had to I had to earn that right which that I didn't appreciate right and maybe that's not a racial thing like maybe it's a team of people who had worked together for a while and I'm the new guy and maybe I'm overlooking it that way but it's also because of the like cultural like non-job related mm -hmm. like moments that I had to you see, we the black delegation feel like this event was very critical to the progress yeah, yeah, yeah. of our success in America. Like because of those types of conversations, I, yeah. I feel like there was like a maybe like a reverse. Like okay, he's like we we, we accept it and like yeah, can, there's a, there's an extra work. extra like work part behind work. it to kind of get yeah. used to each other yeah, versus Larry, me just walking. Larry, why well, have you here, Larry? Can you explain affirmative action in America to me? I mean, just just I mean, I know it's not really your job, but why don't you just do it anyway? If ever you guys see me on video, do this <laughs> and this. That's that's it's exactly the pantomime for when those situations happen in real life. Yeah, I mean, I, but I, I think that's entirely right. Like, it almost sometimes feels like there's a whole second job that's a secret job that nobody talks about, and you don't get compensated for, and yet it's somehow it's on it's on you to make it, you know, to to kind of make that work and to be doing that in the background of your real work. And, and at times that, that is a, a real burden. I've had to spend time making other people more comfortable with my presence. And that I just feel like is an unnecessary thing that people have to do. I feel like marginalized people may have to do that a little more than others. Yeah. But I wish that people didn't like, if you it, want me here and you yeah. give me the job, I'm here. Yeah. And like, that should be that, like, let's work. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, but it actually tags on to a, a topic yesterday, uh, with uh, Emily, how your workplace isn't just about your work anymore. I mean, ever really, it's a social space. It's a second family for most people. And uh, it takes a while to get used to because you're, you're probably gonna work together for like an hour, not, not an hour, eight hours a day <laughs> for the next two years, right? Wish it was an hour. But like, uh, it's a long time to spend time with someone and to spend half that time working with each other and the other half trying to get them to trust you and earn that trust. It's, it's a lot to take in uh, when you're not just working right mm -hmm. so it does take a lot of your time extra sure. time that you would have to do where I can just walk in and start playing basketball with everybody so uh, mm -hmm. I think it's one of those things that yes unless the workplace becomes more diverse mm -hmm. a lot more Larry's and Meg's and Brandon walking around uh, less of those questions and less of those uh, hesitations uh, will slowly disappear yeah yeah I mean so also just just on a tiny note like also when I was working I worked on the BBC at games and you know the BBC is not exactly like a high octane like lads culture environment and yet my games team still had like a weekly he halo game and i don't play shooters and i never join them not because i don't enjoy playing halo but because i'm bad at it and i was the only woman on the team and i felt like i would let the entire side down like i would let down all women if i showed up and was bad at halo and and that really sucked and it meant that i like i couldn't go and participate in the social activities of the team you know, which is another way in which you're kind of isolated or made other. Um, and, and it's dumb because, frankly, probably there were probably plenty of dudes there that were terrible at Halo too. 
All right. Well, we're gonna uh, I'm gonna change the gear a little bit because again, I think yeah, yeah. you know what you get practice by playing. So you know you can come back now. I bet you'd be like, all right, let me show these guys what's up. Yeah, and you're talking about two dudes really bad at Halo right here. If you play, if you play with like uh, you know hot seat civilization with me, I'd kick your ass. But like Halo, less than my thing. Well, note taken. Don't play you in any version of Civ, <laughs> let alone hot seat. Uh, so I've got a question from Mage. Uh, I think it's Mage Carlin. Uh, any strategies for advocating for marginalized folks in a scenario where you a white in the development environment where everyone else is white and I don't see a B. So C, <laughs> you're low on the totem pole and have little power to change the lack of diversity, but obviously don't want to just be racist, sexist, homophobic or let that kind of stuff slide. So you, you did touch on this a little earlier about like creating opportunities for the people who don't speak up. But again, I'm going to let you completely reiterate your own thoughts without me saying anything about it. Uh, so yes. You know, no, I mean, I, I think here it's also really useful to, you know, leverage that position of being an insider, even if you're kind of lower down, introduce these ideas and thoughts into, into kind of the workplace. And I actually think particularly in the games field, it, you know, and this is the strategy I use with like my talk, 10 ways to make your game more diverse, but, but more generally is to talk about issues of diversity and inclusion as craft issues, as, as ways to make, you know, as, as kind of world building issues, like in the same way that you would go, you know, if you were gonna go and recreate the Duomo in Florence in an Assassin's Creed game, which they did, you know, they actually sent a team out there to Florence to do research, to to sketch it from multiple angles, to take pictures of it, to, to kind of, um, to take recordings of what the street scene sounded like, you know, that kind of, thoughtfulness and and research and time and resources spent into making something accurate i think it's really the same thing that we're talking about here uh if you're representing somebody from outside of your lived experience just it's really just do, doing doing the work and and making it a better experience you know it's not something that you're doing in addition to making it a good game it is what actually makes your work and your game better all right. Um, I have another question here from Avocado Bro. Uh, the question is, I'm eventually wanting to hire. If I feel more comfortable hiring people similar to myself, should I do it? Or does cultural diversity outweigh like-mindedness? I mean, I think that it's really fun. Like, I think it's a, it's, that's not a binary, you know, people who are culturally different or come from a different background to you than people who have similar mindsets. Like, my best two mates are like, you know, at school, like there's me, technically Hindu, um, Indian, and like, you know, half a little bit, you know, grew up half in Britain. My best mate who is from like ethnically Bangladesh, but really Manchester and technically Muslim. And my friend Shani, who's like uh, my, my other friend, who's like, you know, technically Jewish uh, and you know her family is from like a really different background to mine like she's half Iranian and half, you know half something but but frankly we actually had all of the same jokes had seen the same media we shared a lot of similar like we had a similar kind of world view even if we hadn't seen the same things played the same thing same things done the same things you know and and I mean I, I you know of course you want people who are going to share your vision of like what is good what you want to create but but I don't think that that's antithetical to having people who who are from different backgrounds and cultures. And frankly, if we want to be making art, we want to make art for people other than ourselves, surely. So so having embedded in your team an outside perspective or multiplicity of outside perspectives can can only be to the good. I think. I think I got a another good question. Sorry, we like we segue right into the questions. It's only because of time. No, no, uh, go right ahead. This next question is uh, again, Mage Corlin. It says, do you mean the lack of power to change a situation is mostly self-imposed? I'm assuming that this is either a correction or just asking for uh, elaboration. Oh, no, 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 so, so I, I absolutely don't. I think there's lots of, you know, things that we, you know, so I'm a, I'm a fully paid up member of the Game Workers Union. I highly recommend everyone here, you know, get, get in on the union. like collective organization and agitating for worker rights and, and, and sort of better working circumstances for all of us is hugely important. But really, I think this talk was was for people trying to make their way while all of that work is going on. And I, I don't mean to say that 
you know, hey, figure out a way to survive and then screw everyone else. That's that's totally not at all uh, the message I want to leave people with. Um, uh, this is just, you know, there, these are these are ways to kind of look out for yourself, protect yourself. You know, try and be aware of 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 you know the mistakes that I've made, and 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 kind of try and find your footing in this industry in some way. You know, and particularly if if your experience is affected by marginalization in some way, like all oppressions are connected. But but in at the same time, it's hugely important to be doing the long term structural work of of, of making things better for all of us. Amen. And and it's certainly you know it, it, to say um, oh let's mitigate some of the damage or the things that we need to navigate is not to accept them at all you know um, and I think sometimes it's useful to name the ways in which we just have to deal with certain things that isn't to say that those can't be changed but that's a long term goal and in the short term we need to accept the way things are because we're living here. <laughs> And that's also the way to, to change things as well, I think. So I have a personal question, all right? So um, yeah. how do we get the ball rolling? So obviously a lot of these studios, we're, we're a referral mostly type of industry. We refer to our friends, people that we've met. Uh, and in most of those cases, very similar to who I am as a person in interest, color, whatever, right? Uh, how do we you got to really make an extra effort to not like go straight to your friend. Oh, there's a designer job. He's perfect for it. But to change the tide, to change these issues, to change new ideas that can come from a diverse group of people, it really does take that, that initial step, uh, that is, uh, you know, very, very on purpose to, to make that chain happen. Are there other things that you would recommend for people besides just brute forcing it? We got to start doing it as a team or else this is just how it's going to be. I mean, you know, I think it's it's really good. I think just in general for your design practice to be to be looking for like who's doing the next interesting thing and who's doing stuff that's different from me. You know, personally, me as, as a narrative designer, like there's loads of people out there doing the kinds of work that I like but they actually come from a variety of different backgrounds and and I kind of I think a seek out people from other perspectives on Twitter like go and play go and play work other work in the indie space I know that's super hard for us especially if you're involved in making games I'm probably about three years behind on my list of games to play but kind of being slightly aware of that going and following other people following their work you know um expanding your own kind of social circle or your professional circle is I think in of itself um, a great benefit and and it, it, it on a purely selfish level I think is going to help help you help, help well help everyone in terms of bringing that perspective to their work and that way you start building up as well um, you know a, a kind of contact list of people that that you can you can recommend you know I also you know, I talk to lots of people in, in my, my sphere as well. Like I hesitate to call myself a, a, a mentor, I guess. But but I think it is useful to seek out people who are up and coming and who are doing work that you think, oh, that's there's a kernel of an interesting idea there. Like, wow, what could that person do if they had a budget or, you know, didn't have to work a day job or, you know. And, and the moment I find those people, I, like I'm inspired by them and I'm also excited to like give them those opportunities. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to have the prominence where people are coming to you for work, just having a list of like 10 people and look at your list and, and, and kind of look through it and, just, you know, look, look at it for gender parity, look at it for sort of racial parity, look at it in terms of gender and sexuality. You know, it, this is intentional work. And the idea that it happens accidentally, I think, is, is a really great kind of misunderstanding or like misinformation about this it, it can only really happen if you do it deliberately and it, it's so worth doing yeah i think last question for me uh i will say that well first because we're starting to wrap up thank you very much for being a part of this yeah. obviously the chemistry in the room has completely changed mm -hmm. your presence has elevated what we do mm -hmm. and it's not because you're a woman of color it's because you are you yeah so <laughs> We are, we're not with that old, we're not with that old okey doke. Do we have diversity? Is Meg here? Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, what was your, your greatest moment in your career in gaming thus far uh, that you also feel like a sense of pride because you broke a barrier? Would you say, what was your greatest moment? It, it, was, it was hosting the IGF Awards, I think. Like, it happened recently, and I think it's like, I think it was something I never really expected that I would ever have the opportunity to do. And so I was extremely caught off guard and surprised when um, when GDC and UBM got in touch. And and um, so I, I had a long dark night of the soul because uh, the Christchurch shootings were a week before. Uh, sorry to end this on a down note, but you know they were a week before, and and you know PewDiePie's name was was mentioned by uh, by the shooter, uh, and and I really had this awful moment where I thought, God, I, I feel so close to this that this is something that's happening in my industry, and I, I really had a moment where I was like, I should just like send them an email and say, I'm not going to go to GDC this year. I'm not going to host and I'm just going to go, just going to go home and sit in a darkened room and go and write a novel in, you know, my parents' basement. And, and I, and I talked to so many friends and it's really the words of a really, uh, of, a, of a friend of mine. And, and she really said, if we give up the space to other people, to, especially to these people, to Nazis and to bigots and to white supremacists and, and, and and these people then then we're allowing them to occupy the space and 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 that's something that I, I you know it, that really got my back up and I think it was sheer bullheadedness that that got me onto that stage and and that's what I'm still so so proud of in a way because it was that recognition of you know no you can't bully me out of here you can't frighten me out of here you can't intimidate me or isolate me out of here um, this space is ours and it belongs to us and and if my presence on stage made anybody else feel like they were welcome and a Nazi isn't, then uh, I got to fight Nazis in, in the year of our Lord 2019. And whoever thought you would get to do that? Oh, man. Well, I'm so appreciative of your bullheadedness. And thank you for being a part of this. Thank you for being yourself mm -hmm. and helping other people oh, understand a little good. bit more about, you know, the plight. And I actually just look forward to more things that you do. So please let us in the audience know how we can stay involved and how we can stay in touch and follow what's going on in your life. Great. So I'm on Twitter. I'm better the mask on Twitter, or you can just, um, you can just uh, like put in my name on Twitter and you'll find me. I'm also working on Sable with the, just an incredibly talented and wonderful team. And we're making a wonderful kind of really interesting, evocative coming of age, um, story that's super anti-colonialist and diverse and really about a, a post-apocalyptic society that is functional and uh, that exists outside of capitalism and colonialism. So if that sounds interesting to you, like watch out for Sable, it will be coming out in 2020. And uh, later this year, I'm starting a narrative boutique label with my, my really good friend and my colleague, Lee Alexander, who's you know, she's been an amazing games journalist and critic uh, and had a whole career in the, and is now coming here and uh, to be a narrative designer and, you know, putting the rest of us to shame. So, so again, it's, it's about like making those spaces and finding your collaborators and finding, finding the people who, um, who make your work better. So, so that's where, that's where you can find me, but I'm mostly on Twitter these days. All right. Uh, well, Meg, again, we have to say our goodbyes here. So thank you for That's being great. a part thank of this. Thank you both so much. Uh, we're both very thank happy. You. Thank you so much. See you. See you. Have a good evening. Have a good evening, I think. You too. Bye. Should be evening for you. Yes, it is. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, 9.30. Yeah, have a good evening. <laughs> All right. Thanks.